Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached the area of verses 13 and 14 of chapter 15. I just want to remind you that in, and many of you are probably getting tired of hearing this, in in the first 11 chapters of this epistle, The Holy Spirit has set forth very beautifully what God has done for us in Christ, where He then deals with our response. It's a precise mirror image of the true nature of the gospel of Christ itself. God doesn't do something because we did something. We do because God did. In fact, we walk uh, in the works that God has prepared beforehand and that is the finished work of Christ. And then chapter 12 revealed that it is God who has ordained our life and we are to live that life without murmurings and disputing. That gets into the heavy topic of God's sovereignty, that man is not autonomous or the Christian man is not autonomous. God's sovereign will rules and reigns over our lives. In chapter 13, we saw that God has established authority and we are to submit ourselves to that authority. And in chapter 14, I spent some time dealing with the fact that that those who are weak in the faith, we are to receive them and we're to welcome them, but not to doubtful disputations. And just what did that mean? That meant that there are those who esteem certain things to be unclean and to them it is unclean and that that which is not of faith is sin so what might be sin for one is not sin for another in these areas of doubtful disputations and arguments and and so on and so forth the doubtful disputa- uh, disputations to me, that what that means to me is that we don't argue about whether or not it's wrong to play golf on Sunday. I mean, that's not what you do with these people. What you do is you deal with doctrinal truths from the Word of God. And uh, I'm in the mind that if we spend as much time in biblical doctrine uh, as we do arguing whether this thing or that thing is right you know, or wrong, I mean, how much further, you know, I I think about how much further I would have been ahead as a younger Christian. And that's what the 14th chapter is telling us. We don't solicit them to do those things which go against their conscience, which they think is wrong. What we do is we exalt biblical truth. And in the 15th chapter, we are to bear the infirmities of the weak And I'm sure that what that means is that that you would do that which is best for them. Why do I say that? Because the text says we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. Pleasing myself, I'd I'd probably tell that person, and I have in times past, I, I really work hard at not doing that today. I'd say, well, you know, you stupid idiot, let me tell you why you're you're wrong. Let me tell you why you're weak. That isn't what it says. It says, let everyone please his neighbor in the edification. I believe that's the truth of the Word of God. Uh, the only response I have to that weakness is edification, teaching, teaching the truth of God's Word, which really gets us into the area of doctrine. So I don't dwell on the weakness, but on teaching, on instruction, on imparting biblical truth that will give strength to that weak person and that does require a little homework on my part which I'll talk about now uh, that's just folks that's just the way I read it we're not to please ourselves Christ didn't please himself and we and when we see that he's the one that confirmed the promises made to the fathers I mean if he confirmed them it's done What Jesus Christ did was absolutely sufficient and exactly what God intended for the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit quotes several passages of Scripture in support of that. So we see that we have hope. And I pointed out how that that isn't uh, wishful thinking. Uh, The word hope is the world world uses, tends to use 
uh, the word hope, but a guaranteed expectation concerning all that God has promised. Strength here is based in trusting God who has given us all things richly to enjoy, that there's nothing unclean of itself. Now that is a strong step of conviction. There is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And after we've reached this far, then the Holy Spirit says, you have hope. It's the God of hope, folks, that fills us with all joy and peace in believing. And the question always seems to be, well, why are there so many weak Christians? Why are there so many Christians that don't understand deep biblical doctrine? And I don't really have any sure answer for that. What I have is God telling me that there are lots of weak people and that there are lots who have infirmities and I need to bear those and that the answer to those infirmities is edification, not argument, not disputing, but edification. I stand firm on the fact that this is God's word and God means what he said. We have a God of hope and that is a certain hope. And if you don't know that it's a certain hope, I pray you come to know that blessed hope. The God of the hope completely fill you with all joy and peace in the believing, in the faith. That's what the text says. Or the faithfulness. That is the faithfulness of God. We cannot separate our faith in God with God's faithfulness, folks. When you trust God concerning something, you're trusting Him that what He said is true and that He will do it. That is God's faithfulness. Why should you be filled with hope and joy? Because you trust Christ or that Christ is faithful? Your trust and hope and joy and peace may come and go. But i got some great news for you. All of God's plan is not based upon your faithfulness, but upon the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of Christ. Why are you redeemed? Because you're faithful? No. No. Because Christ is faithful. We're filled with all joy and peace and faithfulness in order that we may abound in the hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if anybody can take verse 13 and do that separate from the Word of God, well, you're a better man than I am. The only way I can know those things and the only way that I can rejoice in those things is to spend time in God's Word. I believe it, it, that it's basically it's absurd to speak about knowing all things, believing all things, having all hope, peace, uh, joy that's unspeakable and, and the peace that passes understanding if we don't know the Word. Folks, these are just words unless they're a part of your life. God did that by giving me His Word and the Holy Spirit goes on through Paul. I myself have been persuaded, that's, uh, it's a perfect passive, of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now, dearly beloved, that's absolutely ridiculous if it's separate from God's Word. The very inference of the text, under, I'm, underneath all of the logic of verse 14, is an understanding of God's Word. Without God's Word, those words don't make any sense. We are filled with goodness because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're filled with all knowledge because we have, why? We're just walking encyclopedias? No. We are filled with goodness. Well, we're filled with all knowledge because we have God's Word, which is truth. Okay? I mean, it isn't because you're smarter than somebody else. It's because of the Almighty, eternal God and His wisdom has given us His Word. And as far as He's concerned, that's all knowledge. Okay? If there were anything more that God wanted you or I to know, there would be another book. Now, the Mormons, they were convinced of that, and so they, they made up one. Grave mistake. This is God's Word, and nothing is added to it or subtracted from it. 
All that God wants you to know is in this book. Now, why do I keep pushing that? Because it makes up the single, what I believe is the single most weakest area of the Christian's life. Just about the last thing that people want to do is study. Now, I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to suggest that the majority of Christians today are basically just to content to just base their beliefs on what others say, such as their pastor or, or someone else. They kind of let somebody else do their studying for them. Or, well, while at the same time allowing themselves to, you know, be drawn into or look or seek other, you know, other revelation, quote unquote, uh, extra biblical revelation, something new, something different, something other than the Word of God. And folks, that just may answer that question as to why there are so many Christians that don't understand deep biblical doctrine. Maybe I shouldn't even say deep, basic, biblical doctrine. And I'm talking, folks, about great doctrine. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And how many pages is that in your Bible? I mean, you know, it's so thin. You know, you'd almost think it was one or two pages. I mean, that's all it is. Yet it's fantastic doctrine. It's deep theological consideration. And it's such a small part of, of this entire book. You know, and then there's the book of Numbers, which is, you know, really basically... <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, that's a real fabulous reading if, you know, if you like calculating. But in many Christians, in the minds of many Christians, it's dry. It's boring. Yet God had a reason for numbers. And it, it thrills me to think that, that Trump doesn't know my, my name, but God does. And, and God not only knows my name, he knows numbers by the score. He's numbered the hairs, what few that's left that's left on my head and he's numbered the birds that fly and not one of them falls to the ground without him knowing it and there are Christians that I run into who seem to think that God's forgotten about them he's angry at them he's mad at them he's not concerned about them he doesn't love them Folks, if he knows every bird that flies, you suppose he knows every step you take, every action that you, you perform? We were filled with all knowledge because we have his word. I don't know how to convince you, folks, just how much a tremendous privilege it is to study this book. If you really know the Lord, and the time comes when you don't have access to a Bible, and that, that time could come very easily, in our lives before the rapture takes place and you don't have an access to a Bible then you'll really know what it is to miss it as long as you have it it's not easy to miss it folks buy up those opportunities this is a precious privilege that we have to feast on God's Word we have all knowledge in our hand why do we have all knowledge because we have God's Word everything that God wants us to know He's giving me, He's given you and I, He's given it to us in each word. Nevertheless, says Paul, I have written the more boldly unto you in part as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. It isn't anything I did. It isn't my brilliance. You know, Paul could have listed, you know, all of his degrees and, and, and where he studied and how many languages he spoke and, and his experiences as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, but he never did that. Well, he, he, he touched on it, but he didn't go into it in great length. That was not his focus. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified or set apart by the Holy Spirit now we got to tear that verse apart 
I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I, I believe that's a, a clear illustration that God has chosen to minister to His people through those whom He's called to do that service. God had called Paul as a servant to the nations, and what he did was minister God's good news. This book is God's good news. It isn't good news that's dependent upon your reaction to it. It's good news concerning what Christ did, not what man must do. That's what this book is. Yet Christianity today, for the most part, has turned that good news into what man must do. It presents the good news under a different description. It's what man must do. When what the verse is saying is that it was done in such a way that it was set apart sanctified, set apart by the Holy Spirit in a way that it is acceptable. Acceptable. I'm greatly concerned, more, really more than I can put into words, that what is offered up here on this channel is acceptable to God. How much of it has been flavored by my opinions and my convictions and everything that my humanity reflects. What God finds acceptable, folks, is the truth of this book. I have never wanted anybody to believe me, but I have always wanted you to believe this book. I cannot put into words how much I appreciate the few of you who contact me one way or another to point out, you know, Steve, you made a stupid mistake there on this verse or that verse. I appreciate the insight that some of you have given me on verses that I didn't see. I'm concerned, but I'm also comforted by the last expression, being sanctified, set apart by the Holy Spirit. Having been set apart by the Holy Spirit. If we stood and, and taught open error, and we all do. The Holy Spirit would be teaching the people listening to you that that's wrong. Each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit. If we stood teaching error openly, and we all do, the Holy Spirit would be teaching the people listening to you that that's wrong. And if he did not, and if these people did did not come to see that that's wrong, that's of another spirit. Each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit who's committed to leading you into all truth. God said that. He promised that. Now, this may shock some of you. I never asked God to lead me into all truth. Why? Because He said He would. Just that simple. And I, yet I hear Christians all the time, you know, making it a uh, somewhat of a ritual, you know, to always ask God to lead them into all truth. I really do try to refrain from asking God to do things that, that He has A, either already done, or B, is already doing, where He said that, he, that he, he is doing. I think He would much rather us believe that He is doing, has done those things, or is doing those things, rather than our asking Him to do something that He's already done or He's already doing, if that makes any sense. So I believe you have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed. But in that study, you have the Holy Spirit to lead you and teach you. And God declares here that the good news of God is set apart by the Holy Spirit to the nations. And I'm willing to suggest that it's also true where the where the offering up of the truth of the Word of God is poorly presented. It is the Holy Spirit who sets it apart for God. And the Holy Spirit has Paul write, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. Verse 18, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ, which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. I can't glory in anything as it regards me. 
For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ didn't do by means of me to make the nations obedient by word and deed. So verses 17 and 18 are both telling us that it isn't Paul who did it. It is Christ who wrote it by me. We can't miss the thought in that verse that Christ could have done it without Paul. He could have very easily done all that without Paul. Christ could have done it without anybody. He didn't need anybody. In the great wisdom and, and the grace and the love of our God, He has deemed it for our good that we be privileged to be used of Him in His work. Never once should the thought ever enter our minds that He needs us. It is a privilege to be used of the Lord. It's a privilege to endure suffering without murmurings and disputing. It's a privilege to rest in the Lord and say, Lord, if that's the way you want it, that's fine with me. There is no joy, there is no rest, there is no peace, and there is no hope in the Christian life that constantly kicks against the Lord. If you're disabled, it was by Him. If you're poor, it's His will. If you're rich, it's His will. I absolutely believe God holds you in His hand, and you, you may have much of this world's goods and be held responsible for your stewardship over them because you got them from God. I don't know what God's purpose is in your life, folks. I don't know. But I can tell you this. The only comfort that I can give you, folks, is that you were born from above by the will of God, that He loves you with a never-ending love. He knows the way that you take. And when He's tested you, you will absolutely, you will absolutely come forth as gold. Nothing catches Him by surprise. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He paid the price that you couldn't pay. He bought you with a price. He ransomed you, redeemed you through the shedding of His precious blood. He died in your place as your substitute. Therefore, you cannot die. Eternal life. We tend to look at that as, you know, well, yeah, you know, something we're going to get someday. Folks, Eternal life is not something that you will someday inherit, that you will someday have. You and I have eternal life now. Spend some time thinking about that. That we will never die. That we passed out of death into life. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Made righteous, called a saint. Not because you always act like one, or I always act like one, but because we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.